Good morning, dear Zero Project friends. Welcome for another chat that we will have here uh, now, this morning. I'm Luc Zelderlo. I'm uh, 65 years old and I wear a, a white uh, shirt which matches quite well with my grey hair. I have the pleasure of having here with me Oliver Lewis, who is a lawyer. So we're going to discuss law. We're going to discuss independent living and human rights. Oliver, how would you introduce yourself to the audience uh, online? Um, good morning, Luke. Uh, well, um, I would say I'm, you know, in my mid-twenties, very handsome, jet black hair, but that would all be a lie. <laughs> it is a bit uh, of a lie, yes, yeah, indeed. <laughs> thanks for confirming. Um, so I'm a, I'm a human rights lawyer. Um, I worked for 14 years based in Budapest in, a, in an international organization. Yep. Um, do, and we worked together during indeed, that time we did, yes. in our former lives, um, doing international human rights work uh, uh, to promote the rights of persons with disabilities, in particular people with intellectual mm -hmm. disabilities mm -hmm. or psychosocial disabilities. And, and what do you do now? And now I'm, I'm back in, in the UK, um, predominantly uh, doing UK cases, so, but still with a focus on the rights of um, persons with disabilities, uh, in, in particular learning disabilities, uh, autism, mental health issues, dementia and so on. Okay, okay. And life is treating you well? Yeah, especially when I get the opportunity to come to Vienna. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you were here in the early days of the Zero Project as well, I think, no? I was. I think I came to the first two or three um, when it wasn't in the UN, um, okay. when it was in central Vienna. But it's grown a lot since then. It has grown a lot, huh? It has grown a lot. And uh, there is an, there is an uh, enormous amount of good ideas and innovation available on the, on the website of the, of the Zero Project. But let's discuss uh, independent living. Um, uh, Oliver, um, in the past we talked about deinstitutionalization and we focused on getting people out of institutions. Now the focus is much more on living in the community. So instead of what we don't want, on what we want. Is that a significant change in thinking? Is that a relevant change or is that just window dressing? No, I, I think it's relevant. I think that independent living and, and being included in the community, let's be clear about what, it, what it's not. Uh -huh. <clears throat> there are two things that I would say it's not. First, it's not about people living in the community but isolated, people living alone unless they want to live alone. Um, and it's not about fending for oneself. That's not what independence means in the disability rights uh, or disability studies um, okay. world. Um, and it, w what it means is that people shouldn't be limited by um, their choices because of a, any kind of inherent feature of an impairment or disability that they may have. Um, but, but the social model of disability means that people are limited in their life choices by uh, attitudinal barriers, the social, yep. the lived environment. So first of all, it's not about people living like a hermit. Yep. And it's also, as you've said, not about people living in institutional settings. And in, interestingly, um, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities doesn't use the word institutions, yep. um, even though, and I know we'll come back to this, even though uh, in the independent living movement grew out of um, a desire a a and a demand to get people out of institutions, yep. as yep. you said. Yep. And, what, and what we've seen over the past 10 or more years um, in the UN and elsewhere is, a, is really um, some putting the flesh on the bones of what an institution actually means. Um, and the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, has said that um, it's not just about the bricks and mortar, it's about the features that happen within that uh, congregate care setting. Uh, are, are we making progress, Oliver? Are we making... Uh, we're certainly <laughs> we're certainly making progress in I think the global understanding of, for example, what an institution um, uh, is and, and the features of an institution. So, for example, um, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has really clarified. I think there's no disagreement here that an institution shouldn't be characterized um, by its size, how many people live there, but rather the regime. So for example, can people choose yep. their carers, yep. their support yep. givers? Yep. Um, can people choose what they do 
um, it, 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 in their you know, activities of daily living? Can people choose what they have to eat and, and when they eat it? Um, so it's those sort of micro features of individual life. So there's progress so, there. So these are for you the key characteristics of independent living in the community. It's choice, it's control, it is being able to master your own life, to, to, to organize support around yourself in the way you want to, to be organized? Exactly. And that's the central feature of um, Article 19 it is, yeah. of the Af convention. Absolutely. So it's very much connected with control and choice and being the own sort of captain of one's own destiny. Um, that's a core feature and it connects with the right to legal capacity. Yeah. Um, but it what it doesn't mean is that you should just be the captain of your own ship and there should be no one else on the ship. Yeah. So if people need um, support, then there's a, an obligation, a duty on the state to provide access to the support that someone actually needs. And, and, and what if the state is not facilitating or not providing? How can I, as an individual... Uh start a case against uh, against the state is are there instruments available are there tools available well there are um i think before coming to that so it, i think it's important to uh, understand that the convention requires governments to set up systems yes. in law that provide um two things really it's a kind of twin track approach the first mm -hmm. thing is that there needs to be um accessible services that are focused on the person with a disability. So they're sort of disability related. Mm -hmm. And that will be different for um, each person. So one person might require a personal assistant to help them navigate the life world. Another person, for example, um, with dementia living at home might require three or four uh, visits by a carer each day to help that person do personal care. And so um, these are sort of disability specific supports that have to be um, given a and the convention is really clear that those supports have to be designed in a person specific way but in a way that prevents that person from being segregated or isolated from the community so so the first thing that states governments have to do is um, provide that level of support for the disabled person the person with disability specifically but coupled with that is um, action on public services that are available and supposed to be accessible to all. So that means that um, the housing stock, uh, the job support um, measures, uh, food banks, whatever it might be, libraries, but childcare, have to so be accessible sorry for, interrupting for people you, with disabilities. Paper never refuses ink. And we have it in the convention and we have it in all the reports. But in reality, it is quite often very, very different and far away from that, no? And, and that is then maybe where the law should come in yeah. and, and where your type of, of people and expertise should come in. Can you help to bridge that gap? What, what is, how do you see your role as a, as a lawyer there? Yeah, that, obviously what I've been talking about so far is the law, the international law, at which governments are supposed to transpose into supposed domestic to, law. as you said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we know, I mean, there's clear evidence and all you have to do is open any of the concluding observations yep. by the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or look at any NGO report and you'll see that there's a huge gap very often between the rhetoric of human rights on these yes, international yep. and what's happening on the ground, people's lived experience. And so, um, yes, is the answer that governments are supposed to provide access to justice uh -huh. um, and if there's a, a person who thinks that their rights under the UN Convention have... Um, not been fulfilled if they've been breached, then technically they can go and see a lawyer in their country and, um, and that lawyer can take action. The difficulty is, of course, in many, many countries, there just aren't very many lawyers or aren't any lawyers who specialize in this subject. But in the UK, there is at least one that I know, and I know him <laughs> quite there's, well. <laughs> there's, there's a lot in the UK and in Belgium and, and yep. other countries. Um, yes, and so, uh, you know, a lot of the focus of my work is uh, on... Um, in a sense, implementing human rights. Um, Can you give a more practical example uh, on, on how that works? A, p a person with a disability comes to you and says, sorry, my, uh, my rights as, a, as an individual, as a person with disabilities are not uh, respected. Uh, 
and then Oliver starts. Yeah, well, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, law in England and, and uh -huh. Wales that, that do or are supposed to protect people's rights and, and, and um, place a duty on local governments to provide social care, for example. Um, and if there's a dispute about that, then there are mechanisms to, um, to resolve that dispute in a court. Um, there, we also have a, a specialist court called the Court of Protection, which okay. actually could be called the Court of Autonomy because that's its focus for people who, in the UK, um, we've got a phrase of lack capacity to make decisions, which the U UN committee has actually criticised the whole system, but anyway. Um, and, that, and the Court of Protection takes decisions on behalf of people who have been assessed as lacking capacity to make a specific decision. No, no, no. And there's often huge um, arguments in court from uh, the, on behalf of the person with a disability, uh, on behalf of the local authority, on behalf of the family. And, the, and if there's a dispute, then the judge um, resolves that dispute in the person's best interests. Um, so there are mechanisms So there are the cases where you can say that you were successful in... in, in in providing the, the legal assistance that was needed to people, yeah? Yeah, there are lots of, on, on an everyday basis, the Court of Protection um, is there to uh, help and, and, and promote um, the yep. rights of yep. people with disabilities. Yep. Um, and independent living and enjoying your rights, then legal capacity, of course, is, is crucial. Um, is that the entry point? Or should people more look at... I need certain types of support which are not provided, so, so that is maybe the entry point to, to further develop my, uh, um, my access to rights. What, what, what is the most effective entry point if you want to fully enjoy your rights as a person with support needs? I, I think legal capacity is obviously crucial, um, uh -huh. and having people around you who can actually advocate on your behalf um, in circumstances where you, if you're a person with a disability, may not be able to, um, but also having um, a state structure that actually provides resources into disability services is crucial. In the UK, a very rich country, we still don't have adequate services. So resources mm -hmm, mm -hmm. come up in probably each of my cases. Yep. Um, and so, for example, if a local authority says, oh, well, it would be cheaper um, for us to put a this person into a care home, into an institutional setting, rather than provide, you know, a live-in um, carer in the person's own home, which is what the person wants, yep, perhaps. Yep, yep. Um, then that that's often um, a scenario which um, which I deal with and colleagues deal with in the UK. And, and so people and are do you then have legal arguments? To, well, to yeah, there are legal arguments, but everyone knows, including judges, that resources are are limited. Limited by definition. By definition. And they're not enough. Yeah. Um, yep. And then, so that becomes then a political argument where d disabled persons organisations in the UK are lobbying, advocating for um, greater resources to, yep. to go into yep. the whole sector, yep. to, to promote their rights, to, to make their rights real. In, in your personal career, you made the move from looking at things from an international perspective towards being involved now in concrete cases and on a day, mm. day-by-day basis. What, what did you learn from that process? Uh, what, what are messages that might be important for the audience here as well? well that's an interesting question. Um, I think that um, for me, it's important to have an understanding of the big picture. Uh -huh. So sort of the, the heli view of what's going on yep. in Europe, what's going on in the world, uh, and how international law is developed. Um, and uh, and then in the UK, I see the struggle of implementation. The reality. And in the UK, yeah. we have a particular relationship with international law, including European um, uh, issues, um, such that um, whilst it's possible to argue uh, in, in a British court about the European Convention on Human Rights, uh -huh. the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is much more distant um, and there's some case law that says, oh, it really doesn't apply very much. Um, okay. So you have to use the arguments of international law um, within, uh, you sort of hang them on other, uh, on other European other hooks. Yeah, yeah, uh, other hooks. Yeah, yeah. So that's been interesting. But also, I think, um, uh, assisting and representing individual people in, in actual cases um, uh, and bring, for, for me to have the opportunity and privilege to help individual people um, is, yeah, a, is a yeah. good antidote to working at the yeah. international level, which is sort of very distant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Being back here after, after a few years, um, 
What is, what is the message that you will take home with you from this Zero conference, uh, Oliver? Um, I've just been reminded uh, about um, not only the uh, many awards that the Zero project um, hands out each year, but now um, it's been going for several years. They've done a really good job, I think, of organizing um, and uh, facilitating that knowledge transfer. So there are literally... Knowledge transfer, that's what you take with you. Yeah, there are literally hundreds of really great sort of best practice micro projects to bigger projects that are available on the Zero yeah, Project um, conference that are applicable indeed. worldwide. Dear audience, it was a pleasure having uh, the opportunity to, to chat with, with Oliver. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And uh, there will be more later on today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Oliver.